morning and welcome to the Stalls TV Morning Show. I'm Zach. And I'm Josh. And today we're on our 16th episode of the Stalls TV Morning Show. Exciting stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of episodes. And we think we have an exciting one uh, for you here this morning. We're going to be talking all about sales calls and really just understanding how you can leverage sales calls in your business and how to execute a successful sales call. Five secrets to a success, well, maybe not secrets, but five steps to a successful sales call. Okay, and then we're also going to have a, a new section that's called Show and Tell. We'll, we'll be sharing uh, photos of different creations that were shared out on the Facebook page, and Courtney's gonna walk you through a lot of those looks. And then lastly, John Lauchs will walk you through uh, customizing umbrellas. So we have a little bit of how-to, a little bit of sales call strategy, mm -hmm. and some show and tell. So a very exciting episode. Let's start with the sales calls. Sounds good. So we launched a poll um, at the beginning. We want to thank you all for answering the polls throughout the uh, morning show. And the, the question was, which type of sales call do you utilize in your business? And you could select more than one answer. And we have 73% of the audience that selected they make their sales calls by phone mm -hmm. and 73% that says they make them in person. So, okay. So what about that 27%? Are they not making sales calls? Well, maybe they only voted for oh, one. Oh, only for one. Okay. Yeah. That, right. That's potentially the case. Or maybe they just didn't, they don't start their screen until we're actually talking, right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so it's a pretty good mix and, and that's what we find mm -hmm. in our industry. But to kind of kick things off, uh, we'll start with a definition of a sales call. Sure. Yeah, so sales call, w the way that we're defining it is um, not an email. It's an actual interaction with a potential customer, whether that be over the phone or in person, where you're, whether you get to the point of negotiating or not, it's an actual conversation with somebody that's not had via, via email to where we can build some excitement and uh, really explain what our products and services are about. Yeah, absolutely. And from a, a decorate apparel um, standpoint, um, I found, at least through giving different seminars and classes and talking to decorators, um, a lot of folks don't make sales calls, period. Mm -hmm. They wait on the business to come to them, sort of the, if you build it, they will come philosophy. Yeah. And the sales interactions only happen either inside of the store or if somebody approaches. And I would say to those of you that, that that's your strategy is to get out there more and take some of these steps and don't be intimidated to actually make a sales call to um, scale and grow your business. Um, so step one mm -hmm. uh, along the... Uh, to getting sales call success, I would say, is getting the right person. Yeah. Um, so whether any industry you're calling in, when you're making a sales call, it all starts with getting the right person. Any tips for decorators on how to do that? Uh, it really depends on the type of business, I think, that you're calling on. And it might be a little different if you're going in person than you're going over the phone. But most decorating businesses are selling to other small businesses. Small business uh, breeds small business. It's just who we relate well to. Mm -hmm. um, so most of small business decisions are made by owners in the vast majority of small businesses, especially with those with five, 10 employees or less. So if you're an, approaching a business like that to sell your decorating services, I would first start by trying to get to the owner when you walk in the door or when you make the phone call, because odds are they will either be able to make the decision or be willing to point you to the person who can help make the decision as long as you have your pitch down right, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Sure. So it all starts um, really, I guess, with a little bit of pre-call planning. So, you know, just for uh, sake of a, an example, if we're calling to a restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, a restaurant or a bar, um, it starts with perhaps frequenting that place and finding out truly um, who is in charge, um, what they're wearing today, I guess, for selling decorate apparel, mm -hmm. and really finding out who is in charge of making that decision. And then you can take the flip side, a little more complex area to navigate is probably uh, league business yeah. uh, when we're selling to teams. So I know you spend a lot of time at the ball field or I the do. court. I do. So one of the best ways to find the right person there is to talk to all of the coaches, because at the end of the day, they're the ones who have to deal with the right person. Odds are the coach isn't the right person as part of a league, but if you get enough of them on your team, understanding what it is that you're selling, they will definitely get you to the right person and be able to influence the decision at the end of the day. Okay, so step one, get to the right person, get past the gatekeeper, do your research, ultimately mm -hmm. get in contact with the right person. It starts there to have success. Mm -hmm. um, step number two is show them you've done your research. Yeah. Um, what does that mean to you? Well, once you get to the right person, it's always helpful to show them that you understand what their needs or their wants might be. So we talked a little bit already about understanding what they're wearing um, so you can kind of know what decorating technique that they may prefer or what has been offered to them in the past. So 
really show them that you understand their business and what their concerns would be. So approaching a league, obviously one of the most difficult parts approaching a league uh, is distributing the uniforms. So if you have a solution on how to distribute, show them that you know that that's a problem and you have a solution for it. Or show them that you know price is, um, especially when you're approaching nonprofits or something like that, price is always key there to where they can turn a, a profit and keep their uh, nonprofit running on the items that they're going to be giving away or going to be selling. So show them you understand. Yeah, yeah. So really just showing them uh, you've done your research and you understand, and that starts with, of course, doing your research. Right. So we're saying uh, make a, a more calculated call. Uh, maybe less calls to where you're not just cold calling, mm -hmm. but you're really understanding the business or the client, uh, the potential client before you reach out and making sure that uh, you do that throughout the process and, and they know instantly. That separates your sales call from everybody else that says, hey, I want to sell you t-shirts, yeah. you know, when you're actually um, talking about something of interest. Yeah, I mean, if you're new into the business, this this is just from my experience. One of the worst sales calls you can make is to call and say, hey, I'm the new decorator on the block here's all the things that I can do. Right. Because, that, honestly, the person that you're calling probably doesn't really care that you're the new decorator on the block, and they don't really care all the things you can do. They care about how you can help them. So it's really understanding how you can help them. Well, at that point, it's all about you. It's kind of like creating that PowerPoint presentation, and the first 20 slides are all about who you are yeah. and not necessarily about um, who they are or what you can accomplish yeah, for. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so uh, number three that I have here is once we get the right person, mm -hmm. we're starting to frame that, we ha we've done the research, I have frame your reason for calling. So mm -hmm. instantly letting them know, why are we talking to them? Why are we sitting across the table or introducing ourselves to them? Yeah, and some of the key things to include or that you can include while framing your reason is what that solution is. So when you call, it's not, hey, I'm the new decorator on the block. It's, hey, I know that you use these types of uniforms or you're outfitting your employees with this. I can show you how to save 20% on decorating those or I can show you how to get them the next day or whatever our competitive advantage is compared to the, the other decorators that we have. Yeah, I mean, I'd say the goal usually is to get all of their business, mm -hmm. but I would probably start with a baby step with getting your foot in the door. So part of this whole process of researching and really getting ready to frame your reason for calling, it could be based around an event mm -hmm. or something coming up. So just approaching Halloween, if we're calling on restaurants and bars and they want to have a promotion or something that they wear that stands out, on that weekend or that week, mm -hmm. you may lead in with, hey, I'm calling because we have um, some really cool uh, glow-in-the-dark uh, decoration that we think would make your employees stand out over this course yeah. of, of time. So yeah, just, just a different way to approach it, but make sure you uh, frame your reason for calling up front. That way they understand that you value their time and we're gonna quickly um, get to the point. So just throughout this process, you know, I know you're big on questioning. Yeah. Um, one-way communication. Why would you say that? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> One-way communication. Hopefully communi somebody got that out yeah, there. Yeah. One-way yeah. communication doesn't typically work in any sales call. It's all about a conversation. So yeah. what are some tips throughout this process to get the customer or potential customer talking? Uh, to get them talking, I mean, open-ended questions are a salesperson's best friend. Um, so you don't want to call and say, do you currently order shirts from somebody? The answer is going to be yes or no, and they're probably, odds are most people aren't going to elaborate any more on that. So you want to ask open-ended questions, and then you really want to listen for the answer. Don't just listen for what you want to hear and then start talking over the person once you've heard what, what you want to hear. You really need to listen and take the opportunity to read between the lines because you know somebody can say one thing, not necessarily that they mean another, but you can definitely infer. So they say some things explicitly, but try and find the implicit meaning as well on how your solution works for them. Good, good, yeah. Questioning is a big part of sales, and, and more than questioning, uh, really just listening right. and, and understanding. Because when it comes time for step four in the process, where we get to pitch our idea, mm -hmm. hopefully this should be not the necessarily the exact pitch we walked in with, but one that's been tailored to the response and what the customer's been sharing. So we're pitching a real solution here. Yeah, um, absolutely. When we hear those key terms or key phrases, again, we don't jump in, but we... Um, we wrap them up into when it's our opportunity to pitch the actual idea, to speak to their needs and to their wants. And I'll say this, we'll say it probably again at the end, but it takes practice to do this. You have to make sales call after sales call after sales call before you'll start to think that you're even good at it. It can be an intimidating process, but practice really makes perfect on this.
Good, good. And then showing really the customer, um, just to tie into pitching that idea, tying in some past success. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily, well, I sold this much or this much, but uh, an example of a customer that maybe succeeded uh, with this promotion. Maybe it's they stood out more wearing the uniforms that you created on the field where the kids even wanted to wear them to school or, or whatever. The team spirit was just an all-time high, but somehow tying in some sort of uh, past success so they know you're not just a new decorator on the block, you've done this before. Yeah, I mean, essentially, we've talked about it before that referral business is great business. You using testimonials and past examples is building your own referral business. You're just doing the referring instead of the customer doing yeah, it. Yeah, long term, if you can walk in with referrals and, and testimonials to leave behind that, that relate to that situation, maybe that's a great way um, to follow up. So, step five, mm -hmm. um, what's the goal of this first interaction, this first sales call? Um, what do you think the goal of a first sales call should be? Most of the time, if you are literally walking in cold call, the goal of the call should be to get either a follow-up meeting or just walk away with action steps as to, I'm going to get you this price proposal or whatever it is. I don't think, nine times out of ten, we're not going to walk out with an order on a cold call for a decorating business because maybe they just don't have the need right now and we're really just trying to, to feel it out. So our goal is to advance to the next step, which can be as simple as, hey, let's set a follow-up meeting in two weeks when you're ready to talk about this. Yeah, so step number five in the process is your goal equals an advance. So going into the sales call, mm -hmm. you should understand um, what you want that advance to be. Sometimes that's a one sale. Mm -hmm. Odds are not on the first interaction. That's down downstream further. Um, it could just be the next appointment or the agreement. And then really, you know, as you start to repeat this process and, and get advance after an advance through different interactions, it does we lead to a closed one um, opportunity mm -hmm. where you're starting to build the business and then your goal becomes another sale and another sale. Yeah. Um, but as you're, as you're doing this, as you're scheduling uh, this advance, it may require um, some follow-up and execution on your side. So one of the biggest areas and things you have to do um, throughout this process is build rapport. Mm -hmm. um, you build rapport by listening and solving problems. You build by, uh, rapport by following up and delivering on what you promised. Yep. that you were going to do. It's really executing on the advance and making sure you're, you're on time with the quote, the information. Um, yep. I think for decorators, uh, for customers, really one of the biggest challenges is when they order that decorated apparel and it doesn't come on time. Mm -hmm. So you can start to prove your timeliness early and up front in the process and ultimately be able to hold your prices a little higher because you do what you said you would do. Right, yeah, you build trust all the way throughout the process. Every promise that you make that you deliver on is a way to build trust through the process all the way to swiping the credit card or getting the check uh, and after the order. Good, so just to follow up on the five steps, I wanna reframe those for you. Um, number, step number one is get to the right person, whether that's on phone or, or in person. Make sure you have the right person before you execute any further steps. Mm -hmm. Two is show them you've done your research, which requires pre-call planning. Three is frame your reason for calling, calling. That way they know you're not wasting their time. They know exactly what you're about up front. Four is pitch the idea. After you get some open-ended questions and understanding, we're gonna pitch the idea. Mm -hmm. And number five is ultimately get that advance and get that commitment to advance to the next step from the particular prospect or customer. Absolutely. So hopefully, executing some of these steps can help you have tighter, better uh, sales calls. And now we wanna turn it over to Courtney Kay to show you how to create some really cool looks um, that different viewers have shared that you can present on these sales calls and follow-up steps. Each week on the Stalls Facebook page, we ask our viewers to show us what they're printing this week and tell us how they did it in the Stalls Show and Tell. We've been watching this for the last few months at the Stalls TV studios and we just love the creativity and some of the looks that decorators are creating on there. So we wanted to share them with our viewers as well. In this, we've created our top 10 looks for the month of September and pulled them from the stall site. So let's walk through those top 10 looks. The first one that we're going to look at is actually a two-color glitter flake design on a sparkle t-shirt. The reason we pulled this design is it has some really unique design elements in adding the pattern and the um, background and the silver, but also that they've taken two colors of glitter flake and added an extra element of bling through a sparkle t-shirt. This, this design, since it was created with um, CAD cut glitter flake, would have to be created with either a vinyl cutter cutting the silver and the red separately, or you could order them in custom CAD cut glitter flake transfers, but it allows you to create that full color bling or two color bling finish on a sparkle t-shirt. It's really popular and something we're seeing a lot 
um, for school and spirit wear season, especially in the month of September on the Stalls TV site. Keeping with spirit wear in mind, of course, September brought a lot of great school, wear, uh, school fan wear designs to the show and tell site on, on the uh, Stalls Facebook page. And with that, this one's actually a um, three color design mixed in rhinestone. So we have two colors of glitter as well as cat cut fashion film, and it creates a three color effect with the rhinestones. Decorators are usually interested in learning how to mix rhinestones because it adds that extra element that you're looking for to sell the garment for a higher price with rhinestones. If you're going to mix that with your heat transfer vinyl like they've done here, I always recommend doing multiple applications. So apply your heat transfer vinyl first, and then go and apply your rhinestones. This will ensure you get an accurate application and pressure across the entire design so it sticks, stays, and is durable. The third design we're going to look at is actually a unique application for using a goof-proof transfer from Transfer Express. I chose this because I absolutely love the creativity of this decorator. So we talk a lot about packaging together items and finding unique sales opportunities, and this decorator specifically went out and found those. So look for opportunities to use your screen printed transfers and other um, transfer types on bags and things like that to package for teams. So if you're going out for a bowling league and printing their t-shirts, offer to personalize their bags as well, and this is a great look for that. One question we often get from decorators is how to print burlap. So with this item specifically, this is actually a tote bag made of 100% burlap printed with CAD cut fashion film. So this was another unique look that's been created with a vinyl cutter and CAD cut fashion film, but you could use screen printed transfers as well. Just heat apply the bag as you would any other cotton bag, and then this decorator added a pop of the chevron bow to the top of the tote bag to kind of create a unique look um, that's sure to sell. Anytime you can add little elements like the bows and things to the bags, that'll help create a nice element for any type of women's apparel or bags. The next look we're going to look at is another multicolor design. This one specifically mixes fashion film and the electric or the metallic silver shade with cat cut glitter flakes. So a lot of the designs that we pulled for the top looks and the um, show and tell Facebook page showed us that a lot of decorators are actually mixing together multiple materials using a vinyl cutter and their heat press to create really unique looks. This one again, another example of how patterns are just really popular this fall and um, all times of year really for different designs. So this one mixes the monogram print along with glitter flake in black, orange on top of a metallic silver. If you're decorating for school or for spirit wear, you will notice that there's a lot of um, people decorating designs specifically with hair bows and different designs like that. So we've seen a lot on the show and tell where they're creating multiple color designs and different logos with sublimation and glitter flake to create um, different hair bows. So this one specifically is a multicolor design using glitter flake and fashion film. So this design, we actually created uh, multiple designs for either a dance team or school design or anything like that to personalize it. So the Michael Jackson face is actually made with fashion film, and the rest of the hair bow is mixed and matching glitter flake shades. So you can get really creative with what you can create with hair bows. For the next look, I wanted to create one that was actually unique to um, printing jackets and different outerwear. So if you've been watching the Stalls TV morning show lately, you'll notice that We've been personalizing a lot of um, jackets and outerwear. And so with that, we're going to be personalizing um, a jacket using a performance wear jacket with elasti prints. The next pick from the Stalls Facebook page and the show and tell is a look that's unique and has a multicolor mixed media design. This design mixes together three colors of fashion film in lime, silver, and red, and also some pops of cat cut glitter flake in silver to make the stars really sparkle. This is a unique way that you can use colors, and I love the way the designer of this shirt used the bling effect of glitter to pop and make the stars really stand out in areas of the design. It's a unique way to use a bling finish, aside from just creating a full glitter effect. The ninth design that we picked from the Stalls Heat Printing Facebook page is one of my favorites. This one mixes together screen printing with foil and with cat cut glitter flakes. So you can use cat cut materials in your vinyl cutter to create name drops and create designs within screen printed ink, just like they've done here. As you've seen in a lot of these designs, and we're seeing a lot in the show and tell, especially with September, fan wear is becoming really popular with metallic and glitter effects, and we're starting to see a lot of people use these two different finishes together to create multicolor mixed media designs. And for our final look, 
I chose one that actually uses a printable full color design. Full color is still one of the top trends and whether you're decorating for spirit wear or corporate logos, being able to leverage a multicolor design in one pass like they've done here with CAD, cut or CAD Color Super Tech Opaque creates a really cool gradient look on the football. And so I just love the way they've taken that little element and popped that full color design to create a great football fan wear design. I would definitely encourage each of you, if you haven't done this yet, to check out the Stalls TV um, Facebook page. And it's just uh, Stalls, all things heat printing. And if you go there, you can submit your topics. If you've already submitted them to us in your photos, we appreciate you guys sending us your creativity. We absolutely love to see how you're using these Stalls products as well as other uh, methods of printing like screen printing and embroidery to mix and match the different media. So uh, thanks for watching. This has been Show and Tell with Courtney. <laughs>
as these items are not being laundered. Now I'm going to go ahead and decorate a high visibility umbrella with a reflective transfer. Uh, this is a great promotional item. Again, we'll go ahead and find our panel. Place our transfer. Place our cover sheet. And apply. So I want to show you one more application technique using a cap press. I'm going to go ahead and open my umbrella. But this time I'm not going to open it all the way. I'm going to find a panel that I want to decorate. Place my transfer. Cover with my cover sheet. And apply. Give this a quick second to cool down a tad and peel. As you can see, decorating umbrellas can be very simple and a great way to generate revenue for your business. I'm John Lauchs with Stalls TV. Thanks for watching. I want to thank John for taking the time to record that segment, teaching us how to decorate some very difficult to decorate items. Uh, we did have some questions come in from our viewers while that was being aired. So Josh, do you want to take a second and answer a couple of those? Sure. Karen asked specifically um, price point uh, for the umbrellas and what we could sell those for. So generally, um, I think an umbrella, depending on the size, is in a sort of a $5 uh, price point as far as the cost of the blank. The decoration is actually a very small portion of it. So mm. we're labor all in. We're customizing that umbrella probably for around $7. Mm. Um, I would say if we're selling direct to a car dealership, um, you saw that customized with reflective material, mm. I think we're definitely in the $15 to $25 price point, depending on whether it has the high visibility umbrella or the different features and the quantities. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't shortchange yourself. If you're doing low quantity or mid quantity customization of umbrellas, I would definitely say $15 to $25 is a fair price point. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. And then the other question um, that came in, or if, if viewers, if you have experience selling umbrellas and you have a price point that you've sold it for, please type it in and we'll share it as well. Um, the other question that came in in the meantime was from Lou asking specifically what media is being used on the umbrella. So you saw a 3M reflective mm -hmm. uh, transfer that was the auto sales, and then the print cut material was solutions opaque. Um, in theory, if the, if the umbrella is polyester, you can use any of those uh, print cut materials from the Stalls Tech line mm -hmm. as well and get really good adhesion. Um, the one thing with umbrellas, and I actually had a unique uh, situation here, there was the uh, big pop-up umbrellas that you see at a hotel or a beach mm -hmm. um, setting, and the particular company that was manufacturing those wanted to do some testing. Um, so we actually applied Solutions Opaque and Gorilla Grip 2, both of which are nylon adhesive products to those umbrellas, and actually cut apart the umbrella and put it through wash testing mm. um, in our lab to simulate uh, rain and sort of the outdoor elements. And they held up tremendously. Oh. Um, so I think anything with a nylon adhesive, mm -hmm. I would recommend uh, for umbrellas. And looks like we have another question from Jamie is, where can I buy blank umbrellas? Um, there's a variety of sources. I know Sanmar carries a few style of uh, blank umbrellas. And then also, if you look up um, ASI suppliers, um, I know you'll see some that manufacture specific umbrellas and even offer decoration for you in high quantities with screen printing. Yeah, I know uh, Transfer Express recently launched an apparel line. Did they do umbrellas as well, or is it just t-shirts and sweatshirts? Don't know off the top of my head, but we can definitely check out okay. the blank apparel link on transferexpress.com. So, hopefully that answers the questions from the Stalls TV Morning Show. If you have additional questions, uh, we would love for all of our viewers to get active on the Stalls TV forum. We'll be looking to pick up the pace there and actually do some giveaways um, in exchange for your participation to mm -hmm. get the conversation going on stallstv.com. But we look forward to having you on the next Stalls TV Morning Show, Mondays at 11 a.m. Eastern. Thanks for watching. We'll see you then.